my job just to give you an introduction um, to what we're going to do this afternoon. Um, so I'm very pleased to welcome firstly Dr. Alex Maynard, who is one of our DBA alumni from Cranfield. Um, she's going to talk to you a little bit about her DBA research and her journey. Um, and then we're going to pass on to Dr. John Howard, who's one of our faculty here at Cranfield. Um, he was actually Alice's faculty advisor during her doctoral research. Um, so he's going to come up with some difficult and taxing questions for Alice, I hope, um, and also help her to talk a little bit about um, her DBA experience. Um, and then we'll come back to me and I will very briefly tell you just a little bit about the DBA program um, and then we'll have a general Q&A. So if you do have any questions, if you think of any questions as we're going through, please do feel free to type them into the chat box that Derek showed to you. Um, or otherwise, please um, feel free to ask them um, over the audio when we get to that point and we ask you to um, unmute your mic. So that you also ask your okay, so we'll carry on and I will pass without further ado on to Alice who is going to um, tell us a bit about her DBA journey. Um, I thought I'd start out with why I came to the DBA in the first place. And so I spent about five or six years in the transport industry, mainly in the rail industry, working on accessibility issues. And what I found was that traditional appraisal approaches were a barrier to access for the safety people. Um, and I found that people would tell me that they'd have to abandon projects that would be marvellous for um, other practices because they would only be successful because people have to make access for that project as well. Uh, and I found that rather frustrating. There was a lot of policy work around that said that actually access to Benefit, uh, but there was very little evidence that you could use in an economic equation. You needed to be able to value those benefits properly, economically, in order to be able to afford those benefits. Now, I am a practitioner, as I say, I've been in the industry, and so I wanted to do something. I, was, I didn't really want to do a PhD because it felt so when I discovered that there was a PhD, I got quite confused. So that's why I chose the DBA. I chose Penfield for a number of reasons. Particularly one was its reputation uh, in the transport industry, um, in the kind of economic trade of the field. But also, because of the structure of the DBA, I find deadlines And the way that Cranfield does that today, the way you do a number of projects, you have deadlines for those projects, it's, it's well said. I found really useful. So, but that's um, two really good reasons why I uh, take Cranfield. So what was I doing at the time? Well, by then, I was back to the transport from Compton, and I was working in the policy process recently. I'd left my permanent job at the end of the and I'd just set up my own business. And I really had just set it up. I set it up in the June, and I started to do it in September. Um, and that was perhaps ambitious, but um, it was also quite helpful not to have a full-time job at the time to be able to manage my own. Um, my own time, really. Um, and I think one of the really important things for me, therefore, about the whole experience was that the output needed to be credible to my time and to the industry. And I was working for Network Rail, um, and later I worked for Top Trail, some sort of other things, and so on. So, those fairly deep clients who took the equation in this competition, I really needed to be able to be. So I started out on my journey, taking my project, um, and for my project one, uh, 
um, I knew that I wanted whatever I did to take a social on the approach. Uh, the, the usual way of looking at society is to say that a person has to attend to their for their The social model of the social model is actually the new one. It's not that that means to say that you can't have to Because actually, if the environment works, then people are not disabled. So, just to be really simple about it, if I'm uh, in a if a meeting is in a first floor building in this area, um, then I am disabled because I can't walk the stairs. I don't change. You need to change the lift so you can lift in the environment. And then I can participate in the meeting to go on the stairs. I am on the stairs. So I'm on the stairs. Now, of course, uh, when you start your DBA, there's going to be time to get in the lift. And I have to say that was challenging to me, not because there wasn't a care, but because there was effectively big and cold, uh, which I kind of didn't want to tell them. Uh, and uh, it took me some time to convince my uh, elder professors in the academic world that there was really a big and cold. There was a little bit of work that had been done, probably a little bit of work, about that before. Um, but it was essentially uh, the back of the flag that I was there. And uh, I wanted to do a bit more, even if you were involved in the back of the And I, I have to say that that whole process of teaching the gap, not being able to find it, uh, led me to a certain amount of concern about my own, um, yeah, about my own sensibilities and my own views, so I don't think I've but in the end, I did a bit of a review and then we decided on where that was going to go. Just to look at what other people have done to measure things like that. So things like um, environmental issues, uh, benefits of health interventions, and so on. What were the kinds of benefits of those things? Um, and, and what might be the best way to go about doing what they were trying to do? And I chose out of that. A traditional method of measuring non market called the street choice because it is much more likely to be accepted by non uh, science, by the establishment of the method. So, from what it is, I wanted to demonstrate that there was a gap in practice because I was saying that we can do this stuff and um, I needed to demonstrate that. So, I had a look at what practitioners were actually doing about uh, a framework. And I looked at a series of sub projects, which was um, so I compared a number of sub projects to check in and um another one to start last week, and so I had a look at uh, what they did. Uh, and what the found was that largely the reason that they ended up being accepted was politically, not economically. It, it had to be someone there who had the will to do it. It was a kind of a way that where there's a will, there's a way. But my question is, what if there isn't a will? Can we have a way that we can do the right thing to do? And one of the things I, I set this within a framework um, that told me that. In this environment, there was a lot of school pressure. It was a new institution in theory, you might say, but it was, uh, there was a lot of peer pressure to do the same thing. So it, that kind of has negative uh, implications. It's also a lot of positive implications. If I can insert a new way of doing it, then there might well be some pressure to be right. So now on to the big one, which was the experiment. So project three, how much does accessibility really work? Now I had to narrow my focus there. So what I did was to value a mean factor from one platform to another in the heavyweight environment. Um, so to be 
our climate shows um, in terms of all climate measuring, but also where are we measuring? Um, now, our highest external key work is because that was really important to the And um, it was the that I took up the next I won't be sure, but of course it was one side, uh, one side needs to highlight the other side, um, they need to make sure that the venue is going to make out the survey work, of course, um, uh, despite the fact that they were going to have to go to the hospital for their survey. Um, so there were a few things like that, but uh, we managed to get around those, and um, they gave me some good solid data at the end of and what I found was there was a clear benefit to having less station. It was less clear for long rounds, so those who go back to look at the long rounds on the right hand side, you can kind of understand why it's more for it, and more for it, and the same kind of benefit. And that was intuitively right, we were just getting the The greatest value of food is those who actually needed to be on the but that's included people like the the shared pieces of luggage and so on. And it confirms to the assertions that we can make all of these people about who benefits from the And then I actually put it into some of the existing projects. And I'm very grateful to my supervisors um, because uh, that was a really important kind of consolidation. But I'm also extremely grateful to my colleagues who helped me do so. They transport the London helped me uh, by incorporating work that was doing around happiness and um, within comparative appraisal of people who wanted. And Crossrail helped me by incorporating their appraisal and saying that would be the benefit um, that, it, that would accrue uh, with my figures. So they're not necessarily that transferable. Now this is one of the slides straight to my driver, um, showing the contribution that I made to knowledge and the contribution that I made to But you can see that there were a significant number of areas where I could stand reasonably and realistically and under examination claim to have made the contribution both to knowledge and to practice. And that was um, extremely gratifying for the first place where you can ask it. Um, so it was very important that I should be able to know that. So, in a nutshell, did I make a difference? Well, uh, I think to some way the research quite widely, but I have to say, for an independent, that was an extensive process. And it was quite time to be very much like a point of view. I found it quite difficult. I've actually um, because I kind of done it and demonstrated it. Um, but I did go to a big conference where we went to the case transfer, uh, which that year was in Canada. And it went down very well, and I know that uh, a number of people used it. There were limitations of the application. They're all regarded to be sure that that kind of valuation, because the transferability is limited, essentially. You never quite know whether it is, you will get the same results in a different environment or in a different kind of topic. And I only have to do one survey. So there must be simplification, but it was still, I think, quite well, quite wide, and it's actually transferred from under the same by uh, the approach of the market, and they want to fix the approach. Um, the Department of Transport, which is um, less or more uh, conservative, let's say, in its approach, uh, was heard to value its accessibility program. Although it didn't use my method. And I know that it was used in the public project, and 
I don't know what this is. So, did it make a difference to me? Well, uh, tongue in cheek, uh, it's useful to be able to remember what you want to do. Uh, it's just sometimes not. Uh, it also adds a certain amount of that time because it's just more serious. The whole process gave me um, a really good approach to the um, um, I can tolerate ambiguity a lot more and also help others to do so because during that process, you know, the process of the literature, you know that there's a massive amount of ambiguity. And you have to wait for, as it were, the final analysis before you find out really what is important to your question. It taught me to trust in other people's service. Um, and I think that's been very helpful. It's a bit more challenging. It's so many ways for the approach and to seek and to test evidence. So it made me a much, much better thinker overall. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alice, for that interesting, um, interesting explanation of your project. It was um, before my time, but I'm wishing I was here because it sounds very interesting. I would have liked to have seen you um, follow that through. Uh, right, let me pass on to John Powery, who's a senior lecturer in logistics and transportation here at Cranfield. Um, and he's going to give some reflection and some questions now. Your next. Thank you. Um, <coughs> good afternoon, everybody. My name is John Harris. I'm a bit of a background. I started my career at the rally at the transport rally. I think it's about 
going to take a long time, but I actually think the way it is just will change. There's definitely a shift uh, because we are understanding that things are more important than
as opposed to a PhD, and also telling you a bit about um, the characteristics of the Cranfield program in particular. Um, so first of all, a DBA, and especially our DBA here at Cranfield, is all about impact. Um, so it's not just about making a contribution to academic knowledge that any doctorate, um, especially a PhD, needs to make, um, but it's much more about having some impact on wider policy and practice. So people that come in and do the DBA here at Cranfield, um, as you just heard from Alice, um, will come in with a very practical issue or problem or interest that they want to address. Um, and obviously they want to go away with something that they can take back into practice, and that's what we're very keen to help with the um, on the program. Um, but we'd like to think it's not just about um, impact on practice, it's also about impact on the individual. Um, and I was really pleased to hear Alex talk about how she's begun to ask more questions of people, um, how she can deal with ambiguity better, um, because those are exactly the kind of things that we expect to see in people that are going through the program. So there really is a really big personal transition that people make when they go through the DBA here at Crownfield. Um, to taking an approach to work that's much more rigorous, much more evidence-based, if you like, um, asking lots more questions and asking for the evidence behind things that people are saying. Um, and we think that leads to better decision-making and a higher quality of practice at an individual level. Um, and that means um, that it also has a big impact on people's careers. Um, and we see over and over again that people make a real step up in their career as a result of doing the DBA program. Um, you know, either um, into a higher role within their organisation or in a different organisation, or quite often into running their own business consultancy. So it can have a really positive impact there. Um, Alex mentioned the structure of the programme, so I want to just spend a little while talking a bit about that structure. Um, people that do DBA programmes tend to be very busy. Okay, so they're not coming in and doing full time jobs. They're coming in and trying to do their doctorate at the same time as working um, in often busy jobs with families and lives outside of that. Um, and we appreciate that that makes it more difficult. Um, and unfortunately, they're not all quite as organised and good at sticking to good lines and values by spouses. Um, so um, what we've tried to do with the programme is put into a really clear structure and a clear milestone because we know that that helps people move through the programme. So rather than doing four years and then having to produce this big um, document at the end, we've broken that up into a number of building blocks which help people move through the program. Um, on top of that, we also um, offer a really high level of support here. So as well as your supervisor, um, in Alice's case, John, obviously, um, you'll also have two other members of faculty that will be there to support you when you come on the DBA program here at Crowdfunding. Um, and that's not just to give you extra support, it's because we know that quite often the kind of practical problems that people come in with that they want to address via a DEA don't fall neatly into academic subjects. So if we can have people there that can support you um, in some different areas, whether that be about methodology or about subject area, um, that allows us to make sure that you've got all the support that you need on the program. Um, and the other thing I think that's important here at Cranfield is that we is that we put a lot of emphasis here on on the cohort. So we don't take more than twelve to fifteen students a year, and that's because we like to have a small cohort and we spend a lot of time making sure that you work together in that cohort um, and really that we form a very cohesive cohort structure because that cohort structure is really important in terms of you getting peer support as well. Um, because that's the fact that we can help you through the program, we can wave a stick at you, we can give you advice, um, but that's not quite the same as sharing the pain with the other people that you're doing the program. Um, and most of the people that come in form quite strong bonds with other people in the cohort that they're part of. Um, and each cohort also allocated a cohort leader, so that is a member of faculty, um, that will stay with them for the whole of the four years um, and provide the support that they need um, to help them get through the program. Um, and because of that, um, we've got um, Association of MBA Accreditation. Uh, this is something that we're really proud of. There are only nine N uh, DBA programs worldwide that are accredited by the Association of MBA, um, and Crown is one of them. So that's something that we like to show off a bit about, I have to say. 
Um, um, and on top of that, we were also awarded five-year accreditation grants for three years. So, um, so that's something I think, you know, is a reflection of the quality of the support and the structure of our program. Uh, and just quickly, this is what our program looks like. So if you look at this rather confusing diagram, which I won't dwell on too much, um, you will see there that there are seven deliverables, deliverables one to seven, and those are the building blocks that I was talking about. So they're the different um, pieces of work, the different deliverables that our DBA researchers now do, um, and they form the building blocks of the final pieces. So that you, that's actually split up into seven parts rather than doing the whole thing at the end. Um, on top of that, um, we also insist on our DBA researchers formally engaging in practice about their research and their the project. So what that means is that if you join us on the DBA, you will have to spend time either working with a panel of practitioners, maybe having a blog, getting some feedback from practitioners or policy makers if that's more relevant to you. Um, and that's to help you guide your research and to make sure that your research does stay, stay relevant to the practical problems that you're trying to address. Um, so that you come out at the end with something that, yes, is an academic project, but it really has the potential to have um, good impact on practice or on policy. Um, and you can see there also briefly in this diagram um, that in order to support you and make sure that you have the the skills and abilities that you need to undertake the research, there are eight and a half residential weeks throughout the program, um, and it's during those weeks that we teach the research methods, um, the literature review skills, the academic writing skills, and so on and so forth that you need um, to make sure that when you get to the end, um, you're successful, and when you go and defend your thesis at that visor there at the end, um, you've got the best chance. Um, and just some examples, and I have to say, we normally have Alice on this slide as well, but for this webinar, obviously, we've heard from her today, so we've taken her off. Um, but just some examples of um, some people that have done um, done particularly well out of their um, DBA. Um, this is some examples of the impact that they can have on people's careers. Um, so Andy Wood, you can see at the top here, he did his DBA a few years ago now, um, and has since become the chief exec of Admiral's Brewery. Um, and also with awards from OBE, so we're doing quite well in the honours list with our um, with our alumni recently. Um, Omavola Johnson, um, who's a minister in the Nigerian government, um, really doing some great stuff based on her research out there in Nigeria. Um, and a more recent graduate, Mark Baker, um, he graduated last year, um, but he's already risen to the head of planning in Luke at Petlin, um and has been quoted actually more times than that, I think, but most notably in the Telegraph talking about the DBA and postgraduate education. So just a few examples there, I think, of people that have done really well um, moving out of the DBA and really seen an impact on their careers as a result of their personal research. Okay, so that's my brief overview there. Um, so if anyone has any questions, just say, please put their hand up, uh, virtual hand, obviously, because I can't see me. Um, so if you can click on the hand and let me know, then I can come to you talk. Or if you've got any other questions, if you can type it into the box um, to, uh, confusingly, to Rebecca Piper. <laughs> As I'm Rebecca Piper today, when my name's actually Emma Parry, but never mind. Um, and um, we can answer those questions. We'll just send them through to all attendees if you like. You know, the same thing is yeah, when you're... Um, so why is that your thinking about whether there are any questions? Um, perhaps I can, Alice, can I flip John's question on the head? Because he asked about advice. Um, and just ask you, this, if you were going to go back and do it all again, like gay, to death, to thought, is there anything that you would do differently? I would... Yeah, I think I'd probably, um, I'd probably be more aware of some of the, um, some of the kind of methodology that uh, try and get the to do.
My doctor has anything to go by. I think sometimes you don't really realise that you've enjoyed it until it's over. Because it seems like quite hard work at the time. And then afterwards you think, oh, actually, yeah. you know, I'd quite like to be back there. Yeah, and when you recover from it. There are times when you go, it's just a little bit more 